get uh, your name and your former position on tape. So you could give me your name and spell your last name, please. My name is Kenneth Andreen, A-N-D-R-E-E-N. I was formerly a Associate Justice of the Court of Appeal of the 5th District. And we're ready to go. And if you need anything louder, just let me know. Just point it up or something. That's just fine. Okay. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure uh, today to be talking with retired Associate Justice Kenneth Andreen, the Court of Appeal, 5th District. Uh, my name is Steve Vardabedian, and I am an Associate Justice of the same court here in Fresno. As a part of the uh, centennial of the California Courts of Appeal, the Appellate Court Legacy Project Committee is creating an oral history of our appellate courts and their justices. Ken, thank you so much for chatting with us uh, today. It's my pleasure. Yeah, your career as a judge spans back to the uh, 1950s, including more than 25 years on the bench prior to your retirement in 1985. Yet today, you appear to be as active as ever. Um, let's start out uh, this afternoon with your judicial career, and then we will go back and trace your earlier years, including your education and law practice. We will then get back up to date with your current endeavors uh, since your retirement, and maybe learn somehow how you continue to maintain such an active uh, schedule. You were first appointed to a judgeship when appointed to the Fresno Municipal Court uh, by Governor Edmund Pat Brown That's in right. 1959. Yeah. Uh, you had been practicing law for about uh, seven years, which it wasn't so, a long time, something like that? No, all you needed like, back those days was five years, five years of muni. Of course, That's right. 10 if you wanted to go in Superior. Now everybody needs 10. Now everyone needs 10. <laughs> but e even, at, even at seven years, uh, and I know that there were a couple of other fairly uh, young judges on the Fresno courts during those days, but quite a few of them were, were gray and uh, a little older uh, in terms of years. Uh, I just wonder, uh, and with the idea that an overriding, overriding image of judges being uh, uh, old and gray, did, did you sense any speaking going on about uh, who is this new kid on the bench? Uh, well, I, I did get introduced as our new young judge. Uh, I was 34. Now, I understand the person I'm talking with was 31 when he was first appointed, so I don't claim any record, although I think 34 may have been the, lo the uh, earliest at that time. I, I was the youngest judge on the, on the bench in the, in the state. Uh, I found that uh, by writing out my opinions, I attain some credibility. You know, just an ordinary opinion. There was a court trial. Uh, I wrote out a pretty good opinion, and uh, that way uh, I established myself. And certainly over the years, that credibility has been further established. But yeah, you know, when you start out as a as a younger judge, sometimes you maybe you feel like you need to prove yourself a little bit to the community, the legal community in particular. Yes. Uh, how, how did your appointment come about? Uh, a little oh, bit of you history know, behind it. Could you give that, us that? I say in a self-depreciating way that a a judge is a lawyer who knows the governor, <laughs> <laughs> and I did know Pat Brown. And uh, as you know from what you've done, uh, the best time to become a judge uh, is uh, at age forty. But there was this this opening when I was thirty-four, and and so. I took it because I was afraid there would not be something open when I became 40. Timing certainly is everything. Uh, it may not be exactly with one's own plans, but uh, yeah. that, that certainly is true. Uh, now, I understand you went from predominantly a civil practice, and as we know, municipal court was very heavy uh, in terms of the criminal caseload. Uh, I know I experienced that myself. Did uh, did you also go from primarily a civil practice to the uh, uh, municipal court? Yes, I was a civil practitioner. I had a few uh, criminal cases. Uh, I was with a firm, and our charity was Indians. If an Indian was accused of a crime, we represented that person. I'm talking about it as an American Indian yes. and a native. And uh, so I had some experience, but not very much. So, but what, did you do anything in particular to adjust? Did you find you needed to uh, brush up on your criminal law, or was it something pretty natural that as the work came through, you uh, found yourself uh, able to, to get up to speed very quickly? Well, I don't think it was natural. I, I would find out what my cases were before, say, I had a preliminary hearing. I'd find out what kind of a hearing it was, and then I would look up in, in statutes or in jury instructions 
what the elements of that crime were. And then I would look to see what the holding order was like. I think it was at 832 of the Penal Code. I've forgotten precisely now. Mm -hmm. And so I would have those magic words of the holding order, and I would have the elements that had to be proven. And uh, so I, I felt fairly comfortable very soon. So, so you did your homework, and, and just knowing you over the years uh, since then, uh, the kind of conscientious person you are, uh, you became very familiar with the work uh, as, uh, as you approached it, it seems to me. Yes, but you know, it was a lot easier back then. We didn't have all these search and seizure rules. Uh, Judge Warren hadn't instituted them all. And that's right. We're talking <laughs> pre-Miranda when you started on the municipal court. That's right. And so things were pretty simple. Yes. That, that's interesting. I, I never really thought of that when I think in terms of 1959 and the differences in uh, confessions and searches and yes. seizures, those kinds of issues. Now, uh, in 1961, after you had uh, settled in at the municipal court, uh, a new lo court located itself in downtown Fresno, the very court that I now sit on and you previously sat on, uh, that was a, a creature that came into being in 1961, the Fifth District Court of Appeal, which was carved out of the Third uh, and Fourth Districts. As a trial judge at, at the time, did, did you sense much attention being given to this event or was it largely a, an unnoticed change? Oh no, we, we paid attention and we were very proud that uh, Phil Conley, a uh, Superior Court judge in Fresno, was appointed presiding justice. And then we, we did not know the other two judges, or at least I should be, talk about me rather than they, I. I should say I rather than we, but I didn't know Justice Brown, and I didn't know, uh, my God, what's his name now? Uh, well, Frederick Stone, uh, Stone would have yeah. been from Tulare County. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, one of the initial panel, Ralph Brown. Uh, yes. From, uh, I believe, Stanislaus County. He was a yeah, legislator. Yeah, somewhere from north. Yeah. Like the Brown Act is named after uh, that is Ralph Brown. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a little bit of our discussions, a little bit about the, the history of the court in addition to your, your biography. Uh, you do mention that uh, you did uh, have some familiar, familiarity with the initial presiding justice, yes. uh, Philip Conley. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, what you knew about him? I respected him more than anybody in the legal business. I'm, re I'm saying attorneys and judges, professors, I respected him more than anybody else. The beauty of him when he was a trial judge, and I, I practiced before him, before I was appointed judge, I knew when I went down there that he would apply the same law to me as he would anybody else. I, I, I felt he was totally neutral. He was very formal, and you better not be late. <laughs> One time he fined himself for being late, and, uh, but you learn those rules. And how and how do that? This was before 170.6 was available. You just learned the rules of the judge. Finding and oneself as a judge that does take a bit of integrity, doesn't it? <laughs> and so he was he was a wonderful man, and a real scholar. Mm -hmm. His father was a judge also in Madera County. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Now, in terms of your service on the municipal court, uh, what did you enjoy the most about? Uh, the municipal court, which is now in exi no, no longer in existence uh, since everything's lumped into the Superior Court, although that, that work, of course, is still done. But what did you enjoy most about it? Well, you court? mentioned the, uh, the criminal calendar. I, I had the arraignment calendar for a while, and we used to put people in jail for being drunk, and we would put them in for three times they, they had a light sentence, and then the fourth time they got 90 days. And I began to think about this. And I realized that when they got in there and they became acquainted with other persons who were in on the same charge, all they did was pass time until they could get out and go with their new found friends to find another bottle of wine. And so it was self-defeating. We were not serving the community and we were certainly not helping them. And so I started a, a, what I called a court honor class. It was, I don't take credit for it, some AA people came to me and they played a tape of a judge from the Midwest, I've forgotten his name now. And he was explaining how he had this court honor class. So I started that and I got uh, free coffee and there was a bakery that gave us uh, free donuts and we met every Monday night and I wrote a letter to everybody who came whether they were in 
incarcerated or not, they got a letter from me. And uh, we had modest achievements, enough that uh, the lieutenant in the jail became a fan. He, he would come over. <coughs> and because some, some people who were in and in and in got sober. Now, we had a lot of failures, too. But uh, these people were accepting of the court honor class. And maybe they weren't accepting of an AA meeting. Maybe they were afraid if they went to an AA meeting, they'd meet some people they didn't want or something like this. But anyway, I, I think that's the best thing I did. That's truly amazing because nowadays we read about a lot of these programs, drug court and also various uh, programs like that. So that uh, sounds like it was, it was uh, maybe ahead of its time, but or certainly a, a very innovative idea. Yeah, and I, I kept on, we were supposed to change calendars every three months. And I asked the judges if they'd let me stay. And of course, they were happy to have me <laughs> stay. And so I stayed for a year and three months. But then, you know, it failed afterwards. The, the next judge didn't want to do it. Well, that's, so. a, that's unfortunate. So we get to 1963, and there's uh, Governor Pat Brown calling you again, this yes. time uh, to name you to the Superior Court, uh, which again, we've talked about rapid rises. Well, here again, uh, uh, this uh, comes at a time uh, when you had uh, been admitted to the bar, I believe, about 11 years. Maybe. So you're, you're just, just beyond the 10 minimum. <laughs> right. Um, uh, is, is there any one fact you, that you think most contributed to your quick elevation? Well, I had a lot of friends. I was active in the community. I, d I did a lot of charitable work. Uh, I believed in being part of the community. I don't think a judge ought to stand off. I think he ought to engage in the community to the extent that he can. And uh, so I, I had a lot of friends, and they, they backed me. Uh, what were your initial impressions of the differences between municipal court and uh, superior court as you took the bench in uh, superior court? When I took the bench in Superior Court, we had seven judges. I was the seventh. There were six until I got there, and then there were seven. And it's hard to, it's hard to understand this now, but we had one judge hearing criminal law, one judge hearing uh, juvenile, and five judges in civil. Wow. Can you imagine that? It was, it was a nice... <laughs> so I got a lot of civil cases, and I was totally happy. One month, one year, I had a criminal, and I handled all the all the arraignments, the pleas, the sentencings, and the trials, including jury trials, for a whole year. I think maybe I called on my colleagues for two or three different cases. The rest of the, I handled the whole calendar. This is how now we had less crime those days. I, I would guess so. I just can't <laughs> imagine one judge doing all the criminal work of. Uh, well, we uh, didn't county we, the size. Yeah. We didn't have all these uh, all these procedural issues. <laughs> it was I, I'm not. We should have the procedural issues now. But uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not I'm griping about those at all. But but it was a simpler day. Mm -hmm. This is the day of the one day jury trial, I suppose. You know? Well, we had a few. A few of those. <laughs> um, now you've mentioned some of the assignments that. Uh, there were in uh, Superior Court. Did you have any particular favorite over the years? Civil. I, I, I love civil. I like a civil jury trial or a civil court trial if there's, you know, something to it, some issues that are interesting. I recall a little later you, you served uh, qu quite a bit of time on family law, didn't you? Uh, yes. Family law assignment? There was no, uh, I said that when I got on the bench there were five hearings civil. There was no family law. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I woke up to the fact we would spend... Uh, between 9 and 9.30 or 8.30 and 9.30 on family law and then the rest of the day on civil. Well, between 8.30 and 9.30, we would decide something like a child custody case. And then we'd sit there for three or four days deciding whether or not a whiplash was worth $5,000 or $7,000. It made no, our priorities were wrong. So I tried to get a court started, and of course you have to volunteer if you want you want help. <laughs> if you want help from your other judges in getting it started, I don't mean help and sit. Once you have an idea, they tell you you can run with it yeah. yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So I did. Go ahead. Get, yes. The fun I had there was I uh, we had we had no way of working towards conciliation. 
And so, and of course, I had to go before the Board of Supervisors and get money for a conciliation court. This was before there was a statute that, pro that provided su for such. And uh, so I got the whole community behind me. I got all the ministers behind me and, and social workers and, and uh, psychiatrists, and we were able to get it done. That's amazing. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, serving as a, as a trial judge during a jury trial. And uh, I think anyone who's been a trial judge uh, has had this situation where you give long, complex jury instructions to the jurors, and you look out and you just get a bunch of blank stares. Yeah. And as you well know, the, uh, the AOC has implemented some uh, what are called plain English jury instructions. But I understand you had some of your own plain uh, English jury instructions uh, a number of years ago, and in fact that you sometimes used uh, charts, I believe, to illustrate instructions to juries. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I started out uh, a jury trial before the opening statements even by giving the jurors the verdict form so they knew what their job was. And then I would also give them, uh, if I could find one instruction that kind of summarized the elements of the case, I gave them that. And we went over that a little bit. And then we had the, then we had the, uh, the opening statements and then of course the trial and then the arguments and then I then I would go over very often to a board and I would write down the elements and I never got appealed on that issue I don't think it was ever raised on appeal because I would say to the jurors I'm going to be as accurate as I can but if I say something while I'm doing this that seems different from the, what I say in the written instructions, please be guided by the written instructions. <laughs> and I think I was accurate, and, uh, but I put it in, in words that they could understand. Did you have any particular uh, jury trials that were particularly memorable that, that you recall? With not jury you know trials, that, other experiences in Superior Court? You know, that was a quarter of a century <laughs> ago. Uh, I had the, uh, I had the, there was a, a, some kind of a taxpayer suit against the Board of Supervisors for tearing down the old courthouse. And I had that. And then uh, and there was nothing I could do. I mean, you know, it was obviously within the Board's power. Mm -hmm. And there was no statute that said they couldn't do it. And so I had to turn it down. But then I did have the fun of, of representing the court on the building of the new courthouse. Yes. Um, during your time in the Superior Court, did you face any contested elections? Yes. I can't tell you now whether it was 1970 or 1976. A, uh, a gentleman attacked me because he thought I was soft on crime. And the ex-DA, the retired district attorney, was his campaign chairman. <laughs> so I had a fight and uh, was able to squeak through. Mm -hmm. um, was, was there a point um, in your time on the Superior Court where you started hearing about uh, the possibility that you would be uh, appointed to the Court of Appeal? Or was there some time when, when you in particular had some interest in, in seeking that? No, I was a Democrat and uh, the governor's office was populated by Republicans. And then Jerry Brown came along and of course he was a Democrat and uh, so uh, I I got it after he became judge. But during that other time, I was happily a trial court judge. Mm -hmm. I, I could still be a trial court judge and be totally happy. And in fact, you're serving on assignment. You're doing uh, much of that work That's now. That's right. Um, so uh, again, it, it, it was a time when um, the, uh, uh, the next uh, Governor Brown came along, Jerry Brown, that uh, you, you were appointed to the uh, Court of Appeal. How yes. did you learn about your appointment? Maybe you don't remember. I, <laughs> maybe that's yeah, not a fair question. Yeah, uh, I do. <laughs> Tony Klein called me. I, I, we were vacationing over in uh, Monterey, mm -hmm. and he called me over there. It was very good news. I bet that was <laughs> good news uh, during the course of a vacation, and uh, you hear about that. Uh, so you took your place on the court uh, in 1980. Uh, yes. And at that time, you were filling the uh, new sixth position on the court. Yes. And uh, if I have it right, you joined uh, Presiding Justice George Brown, Associate Justices Don Franzen, 
George Hopper, George Zinovich, and Pauline Hansen. Is that correct? That, okay. that is correct. Uh, tell us about the relationship you had with this group as you rotated between two sitting panels. Of course, sitting in panels of three, you would uh, uh, be sitting with these uh, fellow justices on the court. We got, we got along famously. Uh, George Brown was one of the kindest, one of the most intelligent men I've ever worked with. He was totally respectful of other people's positions. Uh, even if they were a janitor. He knew the names of the janitors. The secretaries had offices with doors that were often open. Before he would enter a secretary's office, he would knock on the door jam and get permission. I mean, that's the kind of personality he had. And it, the, the conferences were, were fun because we could disagree, and often did, but there was no animosity. I... I, I I really can't remember any animosity. We ha I had fun with Harper because uh, he he felt pretty strongly on some issues, and so did I. And he was really feisty, legendary for his feistiness. Yeah, he was. And uh, I remember one case where uh, he wrote the opinion, I wrote a dissent, and then he wrote a footnote in his opinion to answer my dissent, and then I changed my dissent, of course, <laughs> to answer that footnote. And, and the paper, it went back and forth. And finally, Judge Hopper said, uh, are you going to keep changing this? I said, yeah, as long as you do. I wonder <laughs> where that's going to end. Yeah. But, but we, but we kind of kidded about it. Yeah, yeah that, that's a good relationship to have, you know, to yes. be able to separate, you know, your, your work and your disagreement with work and, and still be able to get along with yeah. people. That's, that's important. You know, there's a difference between those two men. Uh, Judge Brown was more conservative. He uh, told me one time, he, he always ate lunch in the cafeteria. He told me he, he didn't ever want to go out because he was afraid he would not come back. Hopper went out every day. And he would mix with young lawyers and lower court judges, and he would bring back fresh ideas. And so they both gave a lot to the court. That's so true. And I, I used to remember as a young lawyer, I would see Hopper walking out on the streets. He would yes. walk everywhere. Yes. Uh, he, that was amazing. Within the next few years, uh, with new justices filling the vacancies due to a death and a retirement and the continued growth of the court, uh, there were the addition of uh, two more new positions as well uh, that brought on uh, Justices Wixon Wolpert, uh, Charles Hamlin, Robert Martin, and Hollis Best. Uh, so this was a time of rapid growth of this court and yes. a change of uh, personnel uh, with those additions. Uh, are there any re recollections you wish to share, especially concerning any of those that have passed away that I might have mentioned? Well, I think uh, I'd like to say something about Pauline Hansen. Uh, she was our only woman on the court. And at first, I did not see the value of, it, of having that. I didn't, I didn't disagree with it, but I didn't see the value. But yet, as I would sit through conferences with her, she brought, first of all, a uh, background from agriculture. She was born and raised on a farm, farm. But she brought a woman's perspective. And she never asked for any favors because she was a, a woman. She never, never said anything to us about any discrimination that she thought she had. And there might have been. Well, I can think of one. Uh, when she retired, she had, of course, she was asked to give a little talk. And she mentioned the fact that uh, Justice Franson, who had seniority on her, and Justice Brown both started meetings with gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, she never said a word. And the funny part is, I didn't hear that. I would sit in those meetings, and I would not hear the word gentleman. It was just like people. You don't I mean, even think uh, about it. No. Yeah. But the point is, uh, we. We had to, it, that was an early day, you know, and uh, now I, I don't suppose any judge would say anywhere where there are women in, at the council table or women in the, in the conference starting out gentlemen. I mean, we're, we're more attuned. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading uh, some clippings from an old uh, Daily Journal profile. This is from 1982. An appellate lawyer commented, on you that it was fairly obvious that you find writing easy. Uh, 
do you particularly enjoy the writing aspect, uh, or did you at the you know uh, from the time when, uh, at the time that you were on the appellate court, did you uh, particularly enjoy the writing aspect of the job? Yes, I I like to write. I would write all my own opinions. I I don't mean that I wouldn't take the the uh, researchers' words. Sometimes I'd take a whole paragraph mm -hmm. or several paragraphs. But basically, I, I wrote the opinions. I like to write short statements of facts. You know, I don't know why I put in all these facts that aren't necessary. They don't have anything to do with the outcome. And uh, I, I enjoyed writing. Still do. Are, are there any particular opinions that you recall as particular favorites of yours? Well, I had, I had <coughs> most fun uh, with one, uh, Soldano against Daniels, which is, I think, in 341 Cal Third, Cal App Third. Uh, this, there are two uh, bars in uh, in Morro Bay, catty corner from each other, and there was an altercation in one bar, and one person was threatening another to kill him, so that the potential victim's friend ran across catty corner to the other bar, and he asked to use the telephone. And the bartender said no. He said, well, would you please call the cops? This man is, is I'm afraid he's going to be hurt or, or killed. And the bartender said no. And so on a motion for summary judgment, uh, that case was knocked out. That, it was a second cause of action in a complaint against several. And uh, so, and then the, the victim's family, of course, had a lawyer, and the lawyer just basically said, hey, this isn't right, but he didn't give me any cases mm -hmm. or anything. And so uh, I think I did more work on that case than any other. And uh, even my secretary, Linda Cotta, helped. We cited uh, everything we could to show the importance of, of laymen helping uh, the courts and the police to stamp out crime. And so she pointed out that uh, that there's a statute that says that if somebody is on a party line and asks to use the line for an emergency, it's a, it's a misdemeanor if you don't get off the line so that that can be done. And so that gives you an idea of, of the uh, intensity that we worked on that case. Uh, we cited ext extensively, and I say we because by my Research really worked too. We we enjoyed this challenge, and the uh, the uh, we cited the restatement a lot, and uh, it came back to me just very recently from uh, a court of appeal justice, and I'll think of his name in a moment. That that it was back east somewhere with the American Law Institute was doing a new restatement. I guess it would be restatement third of torts. Norman Epstein is the, is the judge. And he said that they were going to change uh, its sections around 320, 325, somewhere in there. They were going to change those sections, but based on my case, they're going to keep them the same because I've shown that you can expand the common law. You see, you see, the rule was that you could be an athlete swimmer on the side of a pool and you can have a child drowning and the athlete swimmer does unless there's a relationship or the athlete swimmer has contributed to the child being there he has no duty to, to jump in and uh, so there was no duty there and the common law expands by judges it was started by judges and it's kept up to date by judges and so I had the fun of doing that you know and that's um that's really interesting that you speak about that because here that's that's a case that uh, was a 1983 case I believe, and here we are 23 years later and it's still something important to the uh, uh, the ALI people in in looking at the restatement, and uh, uh, you know we have this whole thing with the Good Samaritan laws and 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 to what extent one does not necessarily have to volunteer uh, to extend oneself in a situation, but uh, I think the the theory that you wrote that case on. Uh, almost was a matter of don't interfere with other people who are trying to do the the, the example uh, that you gave uh, uh, talking with your legal assistant uh, about a person uh, not willing to give the line up to someone else trying to use the line 
that this was a public uh, establishment, and you, sh you know, when there's an emergency situation, you should allow that other party to uh, come to the aid of someone in peril. I, I think that really was a, 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 a very thoughtful extension of, of the law. That, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, how, how would you describe your judicial? I can't say it. It's going to come out here. Judicial philosophy. <laughs> You know, whether or not a person's an active uh, activist uh, is kind of problematic. Uh, Scalia says that the word means nothing uh, because it depends upon the issue. I, I, I think that uh, maybe I was an activist in, in modifying the common law in that one case, but I don't think I've ever been an activist in in knocking down a statute. In fact, most of those cases went up to Sacramento, the third district. And the, the uh, United States Supreme Court, you know, they had Chief Justice Marshall. They had the New Deal judges, Warren, Rehnquist. And you could say that all of them were activists. But basically, they were doing their job. I, the one thing, uh, the one case that I think maybe you could say activism is uh, Roe versus Wade. Now, <laughs> they found a right of privacy there in the in the United States Constitution, and uh, that was that was uh, you could say activist. But we don't have that problem. It's right in our Constitution, the right of privacy. So uh, you know, I. I I will admit that my uh, my researchers, a couple of them, have said you have a sense of justice, and I guess if I saw an injustice, I would struggle with it. But I'd like to think that I followed the law of higher courts, and I don't didn't argue with the law of, of other courts of appeal very often. I I can't remember as I sit here now. Yeah, I do remember one. I can't remember the details. But usually we, we would accommodate what they had found, unless it was clearly wrong. So I don't think I'm activist, but I, uh, I do have a sense of justice. Mm -hmm. You've spoken here a little bit about your researchers and other staff that have helped in the preparation of cases. Uh, a current attorney with our court uh, who started her career working uh, with you as a research attorney uh, advises that when she started she was very concerned almost to the point of being discouraged by the extensive comments you would write on memos that she would uh, prepare for you but now years later she she tells me she is very grateful that you paid so much attention to detail because that truly improved her as a writer uh, do you have any thoughts about that I'm glad she's happy about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it if you have a person who's working with you uh, and then and you can improve their work, that's good. When I was in law school, I had a job with Pan American World Airways. I was in the legal department. I worked, <coughs> I worked 20 hours a week. And I, I had that kind of training. The, I had two bosses, both of them sharp. And uh, it meant what I said had to be in the King's English and well-reasoned. <laughs> and so it was great training. Yeah, we truly learn, and at the time, it may seem that those rigors are, gee, that's uh, you know, an awful off lot that I have to do. It certainly pays off uh, later yeah. on. It certainly does. Uh, in fact, that attorney that I talked about still is very productive with our court more than 20 years later. Uh, and I think that in itself is indicative of our court having an obvious preference for having career attorneys as opposed to uh, uh, one-year or two-year clerkships. Uh, what are your thoughts about the two different... Um, types of uh, attorneys that one has uh, working for them as justices? Well, I think if you have a career attorney, the, the attorney understands the, uh, the standard of review, uh, a prejudicial error and how that's applied, how the judge wants uh, the facts, and how the judge wants the uh, citations. Do you put in a whole lot or a little bit, you know? And so the career attorney can bring that, and I've and, and they become very expert at, at writing, and they're a real, real help. And that permits the uh, trial, that uh, p permits the appellate judge to have them write s uh, tentative opinions. On the other hand, and it's not all black and white, on the other hand, the, uh, the short-term person, he brings in, or he or she, brings in 
new ideas. He just got, or she just got out of uh, uh, law school. They've been talking to professors. They've got energy, new ideas, and they write legal memorandum. They don't write uh, staff opinions or, or draft opinions. They write memorandums, legal memorandums. And so you can have you can have either one and benefit from either. Hopefully, you'll have both. What did you miss the most uh, when when it came time that that you retired from the bench? What did you miss most about the job itself? I missed being down here, the camaraderie that was here, uh, the 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 fact that we get up in the morning and get down to work. Uh, I, I miss the discipline mm -hmm. and the friendship. I enjoy working with lawyers, and so having, having uh, the days when the, when the lawyers came in and they argued their cases, I loved that. And uh, so I missed all that. Yes. Okay, so, so far I've taken us up to about 1985. Now we're going to take a little reverse and go back to your earlier years to right. find out a little bit about uh, the background that brought you to this career. Uh, and as I understand it, you were born in Sacramento in 1924, yes. and that you grew up in Chico. Uh, you've told me that your father was raised as an orphan. How did, how did that affect your upbringing, if it did affect your upbringing? Do you think it did? I don't know how it did, uh, and I heard this story from, uh, from my mother, not my father, but my, my father was orphaned at either two or three years of age, and he was in an orphan asylum orphanage in uh, San Francisco. Christmas was coming and each person there hung up a stocking and they got the next morning and these kids didn't even have an apple in the stocking. I mean it was a tough situation. So I, I think maybe he was uh, sympathetic with other people's plight and certainly with my plight as, as, a, as, a, as a kid who was trying to grow up. Were there any particular persons uh, or experiences that greatly impacted your growing years? Maybe teachers or other people that... No, I, I look right in my family. I had, I had super parents. They were, they each, one got to the eighth grade, one got to the ninth grade. And they, but they were very intelligent. They were innovative. My father, uh, right through the Depression, provided for us very well. And... Uh, so I and they were great. They were great people to look at. And uh, the three of us, there were three boys, no, no, no girls. We we knew we were going to go to college. Now, see these eighth and ninth year, eighth and ninth grade people. They didn't. They didn't get to go, but they let us know that that was a real privilege. Isn't that something that they impressed that upon you yeah. in spite of their lack of that education? Yeah. And maybe it was in part because of their lack of education they it wanted, might have been. wanted you to get that. Yeah. And my other uh, <coughs> advisor uh, was my older brother. He was four years older than I and uh, quite concerned and careful and, and solicitous. Mm -hmm. And so I had this great family. I, had a, I was lucky to have a good upbringing. Like, like many of your era, your education was interrupted by World War II when you served stateside uh, yes. in the U.S. Naval Reserve. But while this interrupted your education, was there any ultimate benefit uh, of this to your education? Well, yeah, the GI Bill of Rights. <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful. I, I had one semester before World War II, mm -hmm. and then I was in the Navy. And then afterwards, you know, I went, I went to UC Berkeley. and. Uh, was able to was able to get help mm -hmm. with the GI Bill. Now it wasn't a lot of help. I was married then, and my, my wife went to college too. And we would cook a can of spam first. We would dice it and, and put brown sugar on it and stuff and bake it. And we that spam would last three days, and then we'd get a, another can of spam and do the same thing. And then my parents had us over for, for, for Sunday dinner <laughs> where we got some decent food. And then we went back to Spam again. I haven't had Spam since I graduated from college. <laughs> but it sure took us through. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Uh, what we can get by on uh, 
in, in those times. That, yeah. That's, that's a tremendous story. Uh, uh, so, as you've indicated, you did uh, go on to attend UC Berkeley after after spending part of your educational time at Chico State. Yes. Uh, and then uh, moved on to uh, obtain your law degree at uh, at Hastings, where you were Order Order of the Coif. Uh, looking back at, at college um, and your law school experiences, were there any particular activities that you engaged in uh, in in the, during those times that uh, had an impact on you? Just just the work at Pan American Airways. Okay. And uh, but but I enjoyed the professors. We at Hastings we had the the sixty five year club, and uh, they were they were qualified, and so uh, y you can learn a lot from them. And I've got to admit that uh, we didn't spend a lot of time in college. You could get into Hastings then with sixty units, mm. and you, of course you get through college in th in three years. So I've I've only had five years of college. I never really thought about that. Yeah. <laughs> And I would have liked to have had more, but yeah. you know, you, you're married and, and you've wasted, wasted, you've spent some time in the service and it's time to get on. And so we, we mm -hmm. took advantage of it. Yeah. After being admitted to the uh, bar uh, of the state of California in 1952, uh, you landed with a small firm in Fresno. Tell us how that happened. Someone coming from uh, your background in Chico and then being in the Bay Area during law school. How did you end up in Fresno with this firm? I traveled the state, uh, as you say, I was ordered the coif, and so I had something to offer, and I had that experience on Pan American Airways, so I, I had a lot of offers. But there was one firm here in town where the personality of the participants, they both, uh, the Peckinpahs, one became a Superior Court, well, they both, one became a Superior Court Judge of Madeira, one here. They were wonderful people, and I came to Fresno not because of anything other than I liked the personality of these two people. And it was, sir, was it a mistake. It was a wonderful place to be. Uh, in fact, I think uh, the, the son of uh, the person you worked for, the, you worked for, was it David Peckinpah? D Dave and Denver. Denver and, and, was and the Sam son. was a, 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 a movie director, is that yes. correct? In, in yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Of, of quite uh, renown to, right. to speak of, yes. Um, so by, by 1956, after you had worked uh, in, in the Peckinpah firm, uh, you uh, went out and set up your own law practice uh, with uh, the county's uh, Central Labor Council as one of your first clients. But I understand you did do work on both the management and the, uh, the labor side, and that you also developed quite a, a work comp uh, practice. Uh, what kind of cases did, did you most enjoy? I, I'd like to... Uh it, and perhaps I said something wrong someplace along the line. When I worked for the Central Labor Council, I was work, I was in the Peckinpah firm. Oh, you're still in the and, Peckinpah. And then firm. when okay. I went out, uh, I just happened to be in the second floor of the Crocker Angle Bank building, and there were some labor unions there. Hmm. And I knew the I knew the business agents uh, because of my community activities, and one of them brought me a problem, and I had it solved within four days, and they were used to maybe a year. So pretty soon I had uh, most of the unions and the, and the business agents, whenever they had a problem, they came to me. But also when they had a, a, a uh, member with a problem, a workers' comp problem or a personal injury problem, they would bring him in or her in and ask that I help them. And I never had any one of them ask for any special favor because they gave me all this business. I soon had more workers' comp than anybody else in the San Joaquin Valley, according to the referees that mm -hmm. were then. And I had a wonderful personal injury practice. And all this kind of developed by word of mouth. You uh, had a lot of these clients in labor you know, from your own yeah. practice. And, uh, and they had developed. members, sure. and, and they brought the members in. They mm -hmm. <laughs> and they asked for nothing back. Well, that's an amazing way to develop a law practice. Yeah. Uh, looking back at that law practice, um, what do you think in your practice uh, best prepared you to become a judge? I think losing cases and winning cases. Uh, you know, you understand that there are two sides to a case. Uh, I, I think that's basically it. Mm -hmm. and course, Understanding I, the adversary system. Yes, you know. and then of course you would watch judges work, and sure. uh, if if you saw one that uh, wasn't completely uh, efficient or maybe open-minded, uh, you would 
keep that in mind and, and try to be different. I completely understand that because I, I can think of judges uh, I went before that I tried to model myself after those that I thought did a particularly good job, and you were one of them. Thank you. So I think uh, certainly other judges can serve as role models uh, as we practice law, and, uh, and some of us eventually become judges ourselves. Yeah. Um, now, we have gone all the way through your uh, uh, time on the bench up to 1985, and uh, uh, so let's go now back from the time after your judicial career that you uh, retired in 1985. And I understand you were uh, a partner in the firm of uh, Blumberg, uh, Krikorian, Andreen, Singh, and Aikida until yeah. 1990, and then later associated with the firm of Lozano Smith. During this period of time, what was the nature of your practice like? Well, with, uh, with the first firm, uh, all of a sudden I had status when I, when I got off the court. I probably wasn't near the attorney I was before I got on the court. But I had some pretty good clients, you know, uh, big banks, including the Bank of America and Wells Fargo, and, uh, and, and big cases, lender liability cases, not, not little slip and fall in a, in a, in a bank. And uh, so I basically had that. And then when I went over to uh, Lozano, uh, they, they represent a lot of school districts and governmental agencies. And so I had the fun of, of doing that too. Okay, so you had a little different types of practices at those two different uh, yeah. uh, law firms that you were with. Yeah. I, I, did, I did the bank work also in the second Oh, office. okay, with, with but, Lozano, but you I, continued some of that. Yeah, but I, I can remember representing uh, the state of California in a real nice case. I mean, nice being hotly fought <laughs> with plenty of facts and a lot of law. It was fun. Mm -hmm. Going back to the practice of law, uh, at this point in time in the late 1980s, uh, how had the practice of law changed since the 1950s uh, when you had previously practiced? There are a lot of changes. Uh, I think the biggest change in the uh, civil practice is discovery. Uh, about 20 years ago, in 1986, the discovery statute was put in. And until then, I, I remember we would just uh, basically try the case or try to settle it, but there wasn't a lot of discovery. You couldn't even ask the other side if they knew of any witnesses to the case. I mean, this is how limited the discovery was. And then all of a sudden in 86, we had this new statute. And now discovery is a big deal. And you spend a lot of time on discovery and a lot of the client's money. You think discovery is better now than it used to be uh, when you just try the cases uh, on a shoestring, basically? Well, I wish there were some kind of a compromise between the two because now the big firms are... Uh, they're they're really they're really putting pressure on the small firms, with discovery that's not at all necessary. So that's the big change there. Also, there's a change as to uh, helping proper litigants. Uh, Chief Justice Ron George has really done a difference there. I remember when uh, a judge I'm not going to mention the judge's name uh, had a uh, calendar involving divorces and the judge would if a person were pro per the judge would just say proceed and here's you're saying proceed to a, a layman now you know we kind of lead them through we we worry that we're going to miss some assets because very often both sides are pro per and it's a it's it's a terrible responsibility but we owe that to the litigants. The courts should not run for the attorneys. The courts should run for the people. And so, okay, now what else? Could we have? We've already mentioned the changes in the uh, criminal court law. Uh, I guess that's about it. Uh, well, another thing in divorces is uh, that starting in 1970, uh, we, no, we no longer looked at fault, just whether or not there are irreconcilable differences that are causing a breakdown in the marriage. Before that, you tried to prove the other person was worse than you. And the judge would actually say 60% of community property goes to one person and 40% to the other, or two-thirds and one-third. It sounds ridiculous now, but that's the way it was until that statute came through. And the, uh, 
the child custody. We didn't have modern views on on people, and uh, I can remember judges deciding child custody based upon what some of the which of the two parties had an extramarital affair after the separation and outside the presence of the children, and that was enough to give the, the custody of the children to the other side, irrespective of whether or not that other side w was a better parent or more warm, or, you know. And we finally uh, realized that adults do have sexual, pre sexual needs and they're going to meet them, and as long as the kids aren't involved, uh, there's no reason to decide a child custody issue on that basis. There certainly has been a sea change in family law. We're talking about family law, and there certainly has been a sea change in the area of family law. And you know, I don't even think about it because I started practicing. Uh, I was admitted in 1975, and it was uh, you know all the no-fault disillusion and and all these things that you bring up. Uh, my, there certainly has been a change for the better. Uh, not a lot of time spent in court on on items that are totally unnecessary. Yeah, and the big change has been, we used to have investigators, and investigators were trying to find one, one of the people in bed with somebody else. And uh, now you have accountants, <laughs> and they're trying to de determine the, the value of a business or, or a pension plan or something like that. So it's entirely different. Yes. So uh, let's, let's go on to about 1993, and at this time, uh, as I understand, that was about the time you made the move um, from the valley over to the Central Coast. Yes, if I'm correct. Yes. But uh, before anyone assumes that you were ready to uh, leave the law for a life of pure leisure, uh, you took judicial assignment uh, in uh, San Luis Obispo County Su uh, Superior Court. Uh, tell us a little bit about that period of, of your uh, time. We, we moved over there. Uh, basically for a change from the valley. I, I really enjoyed the valley, and the valley treated me very well. But we decided to move over to the coast. And uh, they were short a judge in San Luis Obispo County. And so for, I've forgotten how long now, but about seven years, I had continuous assignments there. I would get a six-month assignment, and then when that one ran out, they'd get another six-month assignment. And of course, I would take a vacation in that time but I had my own courtroom, my own staff, and a lot of fun. It was a trial court judge, superior court, and uh, the attorneys over there are competent, and so I enjoyed it very much. Later, the uh, legislator created a uh, new judgeship, and the judge, mm -hmm. and the judge was appointed by the governor. And then I was out of a job, so, <laughs> <laughs> so then I started moving around the state. Taking assignments. You know, presently, um, I understand you are living in the state of Maryland, but coming back to California on your judicial assignments, as, as you say, you, you continue with those. Uh, how, how is that working out for you? That's a lot of travel, isn't it? Yes, it is. But uh, another judge and I, who's also retired and from San Luis Obispo County, we share a court in San Bernardino County. Hmm. We have the same courtroom, the same staff, and he's there two months and then I'm there for two months, and then he's there for two months, and then I. And so we trade off. And uh, I don't know whether that will continue. They, they seem to like us. And uh, so if the Chief Justice keeps appointing us, we'll, we're ready to do that for a long time. It sounds like you have the energy to continue. That's tremendous. I do have the energy. <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> Over the years, and, and, and I think you just briefly touched upon this, but I, I think it's important to uh, talk about a little bit more. Uh, that you have been an active volunteer with community organizations. In your earlier years, you uh, served on the Fresno uh, Biracial uh, Committee, and can you I, also... Can I stop about that? So let's stop right there at the Biracial Committee. Tell us about that. The mayor appointed us, <clears throat> and at that time... About what year was this? Hmm, that was... Uh, I, I, can think, I can think of it. It was the year that Kennedy was killed. So what? 62 or 63? Somewhere around there. Yeah, 60, yeah, 60, yeah, 62 or 63. At that time, in all of downtown Fresno, there was one black who was employed. He was employed in a cigar shop, for t tobacco shop. Everybody else was white or Hispanic. And uh, we, had, we had the opportunity to change that. 
I called a big meeting. Hugh Goodman, a black lawyer, a very excellent lawyer, was my co-chairman. And I had this group together, and we talked about it, and, they, and some, some of them agreed that we ought to do something. And so I said, okay, then let's have a meeting next week, such as this time. And some of the people there, they, they, these were business people, see, next week, next year. You know? <laughs> but, but the ones who were eager, the ones who saw that we ought to be changing this, they said, sure. And so we developed a system where we would uh, interview, we would have the, the Labor Department interview uh, people, and we would make sure that the people were qualified for a particular job. We would get from the employer, well, we want this. So the employer didn't have to go through a lot of people. And uh, we, 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 set a, we, we changed the face of downtown Fresno. So I'm kind of proud of that. That is something to be very proud of. Uh, you know, and, and there were other areas that I know that you have served uh, more recently, mental health, <laughs> substance abuse, and neglected children causes. Uh, any of these others that you'd like to, to talk about uh, or, or that uh, have made a particular impression upon you? No, uh, there were a, a lot, and I, I enjoyed the, uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, it. It was, uh, some of it I did as a lawyer, in court, especially the mental retardation uh, mm -hmm. aspect of it, I did as a lawyer. Some I did as a judge. You have an obligation to your family, and I wanted to be home with my family, but at the same time, I, I did make a lot of meetings, and I did a lot of things. And, uh, well, for instance, North Avenue Community Center, was they asked for an evaluation, and I was appointed the chief of that. Mm -hmm. We ended up start getting a new building. I found an architect who would design the building, the, the labor unions, I was then a judge, the labor unions would, would put all the stuff together, they put the bricks there, and the electricity, and the plumbing. Uh, the sheriff's office prepared the bricks. We we had that building, which was for residents. Who were this North Avenue community, tell us a little bit about well, that. Well, it, it was just there to, to help a very impoverished area. And uh, a religious group would send in volunteers and they would do what they could to help with, with learning, disabilities. We actually got buses down there. It was a lot of fun. And uh, so, so that building that I'm talking about is, is still there, and it's a rather effective building, I think. <laughs> Your wife, uh, Patricia, herself a lawyer, uh, likewise has been deeply involved in community activities and public service. Could you tell us a little bit about her? She's a wonderful gal. She used to work in this court. She worked for Justice uh, Franson, and she came just to work a year, but, but Franson had uh, three separate bypass operations, and so she stayed for three and a half years because they were getting in new judges all the time to take his place, and uh, that was before I came on the court. When I came on the court, she was living in San Francisco, and uh, we, we have a child, uh, who uh, now is in UCLA, and people ask me, well, you know, why do you want to get involved with it? She is younger. <laughs> and, uh, and, and have a child, you know? But it's been so wonderful. I'm very, very happy. Looks to me like it's keeping you young is what it <laughs> the effect is. It might. Um, uh, any comments about any of the rest of your family? I know you have one other daughter. Uh, could you yeah. tell us a little about her? She, well, she's a uh, she's on the uh, on the faculty of Fresno Community College. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was what, just, what I, does she teach? Uh, she teaches respiratory therapy. Mm -hmm. She's a director of of clinical teaching of that. Yeah, and I st spent last night at her house. She's a wonderful person. I've talked to her. She is is a wonderful person. Um, what bit of advice would you give to someone starting out as a lawyer? Not to cut corners. If you're going to take a case, do it like you were being paid by the hour and you had lots of money. I think a case worth trying is worth trying well. And I hate to see a lawyer come in and face the reality of, of not being able to afford a lot of time and then just not putting in that time. I think that the case 
shows it. The attorneys, say you're a personal injury attorney on the plaintiff's side. Uh, if you get in and do a, a good job, pretty soon the insurance companies will know, hey, this person is somebody to, to work on and somebody to respect and to settle with. And uh, so I, I think that, uh, as impractical as that sounds, I think that it's, it's a very practical idea. Uh, I've never had a practice where it was basically writing contracts and things like that, so I really can't help there. Mm -hmm. Any uh, additional advice that you give to, a, say, a new judge? Or would it be the same advice? I, I think it's good if you can put yourself in the position of both sides. That way you, you get to know, you get to understand and tolerate the actions of the lawyers. If you understand where they're coming from, it's easier to understand why they're doing something than to accept it. So I think if you can put yourself in the shoes of both sides, uh, not, not to be a protagonist for either side, but to understand what, where they're coming from and what's important to them and how they see the evidence. Mm -hmm. As you sit here today, what would you most like the uh, general community and the legal community uh, to remember uh, about you and your work as a judge? Oh, I don't know. I, <laughs> I guess that I've, he tried to be fair. I, I'd be happy with that. Mm -hmm. Well, Justice Andrine, I want to thank you so much for your uh, time and sharing with us your thoughts uh, and for your many years of, of dedicated and conscientious public service. It really has been my privilege to visit with you today. Thank you. Thanks. Okay.